Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Amos. The Old Testament book of Amos and the book of Amos in chapter number 5. Of course, we are continuing on and still at the very beginning of our beginning of our series of the minor prophets. That what we're doing is taking one minor prophet a week, going Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, moving on to another minor prophet, just enough to give a taste on these minor prophets. Of course, we started with the book of Hosea and got to see the great love that God has, this pursuing love. Then we went to the book of Joel and saw God's promises to his people Israel, including future promises of revivals yet to come. And now as we come to the book of Amos, we understand that the context is God has sent a southern preacher to go up north and try to clear up to those Yankees up there about how to truly worship and follow after God. Of course, Amos came from the southern kingdom of Judah. He was a herdsman. He was just a simple uh, uh, farm worker. But God sent him up there with a message to go preach to those folks and to try to point out that God was not happy with the things that are going on. And as we come to the book of Amos in chapter number 5, we find some of the heart matter of why God is so upset. And by the way, God is upset with the people in Israel because of their quote-unquote worship to God. So notice, if you don't mind, in the book of Amos, chapter number 5. The book of Amos, chapter number 5, and notice with me in verse number 14. Amos, chapter 5, and verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. In Amos, chapter 5, and verse 14. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you, as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good, and establish judgment in the gate, that it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas! Alas! And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear meet him, or went into the house and leaned on his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings with your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chim. Your images, the star of your God, which you have made to yourselves. Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And if you don't mind, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you actually might 
mark three creatures that God mentions in an odd story as an illustration in the book of Amos chapter number five. The book of Amos chapter five and verse number 19, God mentions three animals to give an illustration about what he is going to do to Israel. Notice in verse number 19, a lion, a bear, and a serpent. A lion, bear, and serpent. And with the Lord's help, with this illustration in mind, we're just going to entitle this Lion, Bear, and a Serpent. Let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come unto you, Lord, I'm asking that you would just give us great wisdom, that you would open up the Bible in a special way. More importantly, that you would reveal your own heart. We know that you're an emotional God, Lord. We know that you have feelings, you have likes, you have things that you have ordered. And there are things that are not acceptable that are done in your name. I'm asking that you would use this to, with the spotlight of your Holy Spirit to give us understanding, maybe even understanding beyond ourselves, Lord, we know that in the context, the people hated this message and they attempted to kill Amos for this message. Lord, I'm asking that this being a hard message, it is something I cannot attempt to do myself. So the best I know how I surrender myself, I reckon myself dead and ask that you fill me with your precious spirit that you can get your own work accomplished, that you could arrest our attention, and that you would make us more determined to find out what pleases you and do that, rather than depend upon our own thoughts and ideas, opinions, preferences, or the way that we think it ought to be done. I'm asking, Lord, that we would be a biblical people, that we may be pleasing unto you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to this troubling passage, it is one that is very dark and very warning, and it once again reveals the heart of God towards the things that is going on in the name of worship in the northern kingdom. The very first thing I'd like to point out from this text is the day of the Lord, the day of of the Lord. Now, if you might remember, we've actually covered this phrase before in the book of Joel, that the day of the Lord always promotes judgment. It is the time where God is going to judge his people. And he starts off by saying the things that are going on, if you remember the context, what we went on on Sunday morning, that the people have not returned to God in chapter 4. You have not returned to me, yet you have not returned to me, yet you have not returned to me, yet you have not returned to me. And he gave them the solution that they were actually supposed to seek God. Seek God. Now remember, let's define our terms. The idea to seek God is not just to say, hi, how are you? But the idea of seeking God is to find out what he wants. For example, if somebody said, you know, I've got a great decision. I got to decide where I'm going to move. So God, I'm asking you to show me what you want. I'm asking you to bless me with a house. Hey, I want the house over there. They haven't sought for what God wants, what God knows is best. What they've done is they've asked God to religiously bless my decision and I'm going to make my decision. Does that make sense? Some people think that's what's seeking God. As long as I say a prayer, as long as I do something religious, I'm good. But the idea of seeking God goes more than just saying a prayer. It's actually looking for what God wants in the matter. What God's heart in the matter is. What God has designed. That's what the idea of seeking him. It's waiting on him. Looking for what he has in mind. Knowing that God is always good and God is always right. Knowing that God has our best in mind with his glory to be exalted. Again, how many times have we made our own decision? We've said a prayer. God, help me with this. And then we make our own decision anyways. And we don't even take the time to actually seek for what God wants in the matter. 
And yet we have so many decisions we make on our own all the time that have consequences that go past normally what we can see. And God is placing emphasis, yet you have not returned to me. What they've been doing is doing whatever they want, and they've been making it religious, thinking as long as I make it religious, it's acceptable. And God is underlining, no, this is not acceptable. This is not right. And we'll get more into that in a second. But he starts off by explaining about the day of the Lord. That God has pronounced judgment upon the nation of Israel. And we're going to see the reasons why in just a moment. But he starts off by talking about the day of the Lord. Notice with me in verse number 16. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts. Now, I love the names of God. If you would notice, all throughout the book of Amos, God puts the God of hosts as his name over and over. Remember that the God of hosts is the name of God that refers to God who is in charge of all the armies of heaven. What this does is it carries the idea of authority. You remember when you were in the playground with you and your kids and you're pushing someone or they talking back to you and you go, you and what army? Well, God is telling you what army. <laughs> all my armies. I'm in charge and I have everyone to back me up. It carries the idea of authority that God has the authority, the right, and the ability to carry out his wishes because of their disobedience. You know, it's one thing to have some wimpy king who goes, stop it, guys. And you go, why? Because I said so. And no one's going to obey because there's no authority behind it. I'm going to tell. When did that ever work? Unless they were going to tell someone that had authority that you were afraid of, right? And so God is backing up that I have the authority. I have the ability. I have the power. I have the right to bring judgment down. You should listen to me because I have that ability. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's establishing his authority with the name of God, the Lord of hosts throughout here. Because the people have gotten to the idea, I can do whatever I want and put it in Jesus' name if we were to modernize it. I could do whatever I want and say in Jesus' name and I'm fine. And God's not going to do anything. But that's called presuming upon his grace. There are things that God expects. There are God, things that God wants. And again, God is saying, I have the authority. You should want to do those things that are pleasing with me because of whom I am. Notice as he goes on, verse 16. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord. Again, notice God is establishing authority by repeating his names over and over. Just in case you forget, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the Lord. I'm letting you know who you're speaking to, who's addressing this. God, God Almighty, it is him that we have to please. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such that are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Now notice this descriptive language, this wailing and mourning and lamentation. These are descriptive terms that carry the idea of great loss, of great heartbreak, of great tragedy. And God is saying, because of your actions, because of the way that you're carrying yourself, I'm done. You've had your chance. I'm done. You refuse to repent. You just say, I'll do things my own way. By the way, as you look at the history of Israel, you see this is true. He is just preaching this. That what God is going to do is he is going to send the Assyrian Empire to come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. This is a watershed mark. This is a thing that the history of the northern kingdom of Israel is leading to. And in 722 BC, they are indeed conquered and wiped off the map by the Assyrian Empire. 
Now, as a reminder, and as we've already said in the last several books, the Assyrian Empire are the Nazis of the ancient world. And when they took over a nation, they were not kind about it. I've given you descriptions before about how they were known for filleting people alive. And that they would actually, while they're still alive, hook people and cut them and tear their skin off while they're still alive. The good kings, the ones that were considered the most morally good, would actually go into a city and when they would conquer it, they would take the heads of all the fighters that fought against them and build a pyramid out of their heads. And that was the good kings. I can't say all the things the evil kings did. And God is saying, I'm going to send this nation to you. And when they come, it is not going to be pleasant. There is going to be wailing and mourning and lamentation. It is going to be a horrible time. Notice as God places the emphasis again here in verse number 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Now let's pause here. What does this mean? This isn't carrying the idea that, hey, you know what? I'm just tired of life. You go ahead and send the bad guys. What this is carrying on is that they refuse to change their behavior. And they're asking for it. And they're asking for it. And they're asking for it. And finally, the parent takes and spanks the child. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And soon you have to do something about it. And so... He's building a case saying, don't desire this. Don't make it come. This is not what I want for you. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Now again, what is the thing that's causing this? They, we'll get into that in a second. I'm going to give you the reason why they're provoking God in just a second. And just to show how complete this destruction is, God gives a story to give an image in your head. In verse number 19, he gives a story of a man who's out in the middle of the wilderness, minding his own business, and all of a sudden a lion comes. And we spoke about a lion before. Maybe the lion roars. Maybe he sees the lion. And he can sense that tingling in the back. He knows he's in danger. And so Anyone in his right mind who had the ability not to freeze up would immediately run for their lives. You would do anything you can. Maybe you scrambled up a building. Maybe you tried to get away. Maybe you ducked to somewhere where he couldn't go. Maybe in this case, imagine that he had a lion that was chasing after him. And just to free himself, he runs into a cave. Oh, good. And the lion runs somewhere else. Maybe he got distracted. Maybe he's chasing your friend who you tripped and you try to get away with. Whatever the story is. But he gets away. <sighs> Taking a breath. And as he's breathing in the cave, all of a sudden he hears another roar. It's a different tenor and a different pitch. He looks over and there's a mama bear. And he just disturbed the cub's nest. Now mama bear's not happy. So he runs out of the cave again and takes off again. And the bear's chasing, arr, arr, and he's running for his life and he gets away. He finally gets into a house. Maybe it's his own house. And you can imagine being chased by a lion and being chased by a bear. How your heart would be pounding. How you'd be catching your breath. And to get away, what the sigh of relief would be. And as he leans in the door, wow, what a day. A serpent. A rattler, a viper, comes and bites him. And maybe in the calf, maybe in the leg. And the poison gets in his veins and he dies. And you'd almost think someone like that is doomed. Because if the bear didn't get you, the lion didn't get you, the bear would get you. If the bear doesn't get you, the serpent gets you. And it's pacing an illustration the saying, listen, there's nowhere you can go to get away from this judgment. The Assyrians are coming and they are going to wipe everything out. And by the way, they did. This was prophecy. It is now our history. It happened exactly as God said. Now, this is pretty frightening. Why in the world would God list and declare judgment so complete upon these people? 
Well, notice in verse 20 to finish it up. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? So again, he's placing emphasis Talking about the day of the Lord. This is not something you want. This is not something you ask for. Uh, This is not something to play around with. It's almost like someone who's lacking discernment said, Yeah, man, I'm going to hell because my buddies are going to hell. And we're just going to have a big party. Someone who speaks like that is speaking from a lack of discernment. They do not realize what danger they are truly in. The same thing with these people, Israel. They're taking it flippantly. The preacher Amos is preaching and he's preaching hard and he's trying to say God is not happy. And their faces are like, (laughs) yeah, not a big deal. Remember that they're in a time of prosperity. They're a time where everything's going well. They're in a time where everything's hunky-dory. And this preacher wants to come and say, we're in danger. (laughs) Yeah. And they just ignored him. And God's saying, no, 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 listen, this is a warning you need to pay attention to. Don't hasten this. This is not something you want. This is not something you desire. It is something that is going to be complete darkness, mourning and wailing this day of the Lord. Which brings the question up, why is it that God is so angry with them. Why is it that God is ordering the destruction? The second thing I want to show you, not only the day of the Lord, but the disgust of the Lord. The disgust of the Lord. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 21. And again, remember that God is emotional. Normally, we quote, God is love, Jesus is love, and we have the idea of Jesus up on the cloud and rainbows and Angels of however you see and people and pearly gates. And God is love. And we picture the idea of love as a picture and not so much of emotion. Think about that. Have you ever thought about God as love? And that he has a feeling and emotion of love? Normally we really divorce God and put him somewhere else. And that he doesn't share the same feelings that we do. I want you to notice the emotions of God and listen as if you were saying it and the feelings you would have if you said it. Notice in verse 21, I hate, I hate. Now I want you to think about something you hate. Think about the feeling it goes. Maybe there's a situation, I hate this. Maybe there's a person that's offended you and you still have some bitterness towards them. I hate them. Just think about that emotion that you have and transfer it that God has this emotion. I hate this. I hate this situation. I hate what you're doing. Notice this other emotion in verse 21. I hate And just to double down on it, I despise your feast days. I will not smell it in your solemn assemblies. I hate it. I despise it. Now, what is he speaking about? He's speaking about their religion. Notice in verse 22. Thou, though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. By the way, why will he not accept them? Because he hates them. He despises them. He has emotion. It's not a cold calculated, nope, that's not acceptable. It is an emotion that goes with it. I hate that. I despise it. It makes me sick. I'm disgusted with it. Now those are things we don't normally struggle with God. You ever notice, wonder why? I mean, normally we just don't think about it. But why wouldn't we think about the disgust of God? Partly it's because if God is cold and calculating, then it doesn't bother us that much if we do the things that doesn't offend him. But if we realize that there's an emotion with it, I hate that. It makes me sick. I am disgusted with it. You understand that puts a lot more color, imagery to it. You know, it's one thing, don't do that. That does not make me happy. I'll do it if I want to. And wouldn't that be the attitude that most people have? 
<laughs> if it's a cold black and white rule, well, I want to break the rule. But when it comes to God saying, listen, don't do that. I hate that. It makes me sick. I'm disgusted with that. Well, that's a little bit different. We don't want to get God disgusted and mad. And again, we don't feel, we don't understand, we don't assimilate how many things we do in the name of Christ, in the name of religion, that actually makes God sick. We'll show you some. But let me give you the history of this. Hit with me in verse number 25. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years O house of Israel. Now God goes back and says, all right, you remember they're in the time of Moses. You wandered around for 40 days and for, uh, for 40 years rather. For 40 years, I said, follow me. And did the people really follow God? No. Did they really enjoy following God? Did they kind of do whatever they wanted to? Over and over. And then anything that didn't meet their way, what did they do? Complained. You understand that time of the period of Moses is such an important thing. God goes back to it all the time. He says, you know what? You were in the wilderness. I told you to obey. Yeah, nah, yeah. Why did God do this to me? God's being mean. And again, we saw how upset God was during that period with Moses. He was not happy at all. Now, verse 25 covers the period of Moses. And you'd almost think that that was as bad as it got. But did you know it got worse? It got worse than that. How did it get worse? Notice in verse number 26. But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Kuhim in your images. And the star of your God which you have made yourselves. Alright, let me catch you up on the history. We know that the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel would be Saul. After, Saul was a man after the people's own heart. After that came King David, who was a man after God's own heart. After David, David had a son by the name of Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man. However, because of his love of women and ended up having a thousand wives and concubines, they turned his heart and he began to serve other gods. His heart was no longer towards God and God alone. And so he began to worship other gods. So God got angry with that. And he tore the kingdom in two. The southern kingdom became known as Judah. And the first king of the southern kingdom was Rehoboam, Solomon's son. The northern kingdom was now called Israel. It's also referred to as Samaria. It is also called Ephraim of the tribe of Joseph. It was the premier tribe out of the ten of the north. And that northern kingdom, the first king was Jeroboam. Now the problem was, is that God had put in his law that everyone was supposed to go to the temple and worship God the way that God said once a year. It was a requirement. Well, Jeroboam didn't want all of his people to go down to the southern kingdom. They might get the idea that they were doing things right. So what Jeroboam did is he put two religious places of Gilgal and of Bethel. And he said, you know what? You don't have to travel all that far. Why don't you come to a place of worship closer to your own homes? And in this place, he put golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Gilgal. And he said, these are the gods that led you out of wilderness. Could you imagine that? God hated the golden calf, but he revised history and brought them back. Now, because they could not follow the same worship. He changed the worship practices of, <coughs> of Bethel in Gilgal. So he didn't worship the way the Bible said. He made up his own worship. But they all did it in God's name. They made a new calendar. They put new holidays. And then they put a brand new priesthood. They found all the bums on the street that didn't have a job. And said, guess what? You're now a priest. And so all the Levites went down to the southern kingdom who taught the law. And the northern kingdom had a brand new set. But the thing was, they worshiped God how they want it. But they did it in God's name. That God should accept my worship however I want. And may I say the underscore message here is that God does not accept 
all worship. Now, in 20th century, 21st century America, that's taboo. People don't believe that. They believe that God should accept whatever I give to him. As long as I do it in Jesus' name, God is happy with me. And according to this passage and many others, God is not. May I illustrate that? There were two brothers that were listed in the Bible. And God ordered those brothers and said, This is how I want you to worship me. This is what I want you to bring. This is what I want you to do. And one of them said, Yes, God, I want to do it your way. And they worshiped the way that God said. And God accepted their worship. The other one said, no God, I want to worship you the way that I feel like it. And so I'm going to do it the way I want. But I'm going to say it in God's name and you better take it. And you know what? God accepted the one that he said his way. And he refused to take the one who tried to do it his own way. Now both of them did their best. Both of them gave their best. Both of them did it for the purpose of worshiping God. But God accepted one and he refused the other. Of course, you're familiar with the story. It's Cain and Abel. Do you know that God would not accept Cain's sacrifice? His his offering? Cain gave his best to God and God would not accept it. Cain did it in true worship to God, at least in his mind, meaning he wasn't giving it to a false God. He was giving it to the real God, and God would not accept it. Why? Well, Jesus made it very clear in the gospel record of John chapter 4 that God must, must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That means in order to worship God, we must worship God the way that he said must be worshipped. Now this is where the problem is. is because people don't know the Bible, they don't know how God wants to be worshipped. So they say, I could worship God however I want. And they may be doing it out of ignorance, but like Cain, they're doing it sincerely. Like Cain, they're doing their best, but like Cain, God will not accept it. And this is where Israel, the northern kingdom, has got. They are doing all of these religious ceremonies. They're doing all these things. But they're doing it in God's name. And God says, it makes me sick. I'm disgusted. I hate that. It drives me crazy. No! Do you understand that this is also referenced in the same kind of way in the New Testament? We're coming back to Amos. But turn with me to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, at the very beginning, Jesus Christ writes a letter to seven different churches. And with these seven different churches, he writes what is good about them and he writes what's wrong with them. He writes them for the purpose that they would change their ways and get right. He is giving them a warning. But I want you to notice with me the last church that is mentioned, the church of Lady Osea, in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. Again, Jesus is writing this letter. This isn't a preacher. This isn't someone who's making things up. Jesus wrote this letter. And notice what he says to the church of Lady Osea. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, notice with me in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Lady Oceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Notice this, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. Now let's pause there. God is saying, I'd rather you be on fire from God or lost. Imagine that. I'd rather you be on fire for God or lost. You say, why would God say that? Because if a Christian is not living for the, for the Lord, he's bringing a bad name to God. God says, no. To, to say, I'm doing this in the name of God. And God says, I didn't order that. I'd rather you not claim to be a Christian than do that. Notice again the emotion that comes out. Uh, so then I'd rather thou were... Uh, <coughs> um, I know that thou were neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. 
Verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why does he spew them out of his mouth? Because he's disgusted. Because it makes him sick. Because it's not acceptable to him. You understand, this is something that rages from a story I gave you in the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. This has been something that God has dealt with. The idea of people trying to worship God in the way that they think God should accept instead of in spirit and in truth. The way that God declared to be worshipped. And because of that, he's going to destroy the northern kingdom because they refuse to get right. They refuse to change it. Let's hit specifics now. Verse 21. I hate, uh, back to Amos chapter 5, verse 21. I hate I despise your feast days and will not smell your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. He says, notice these people were giving offerings. They were giving to the Lord, but they were doing it in the way that they thought he should accept it. And God says, I'm not accepting that. I won't accept that. Notice verse 23. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. For I will not hear the melody of thy vials. What is this talking about? Music? That they were getting to the idea that they could worship God however they wanted, even in music. Again, as I made a preference earlier today, music is mentioned close to 800 times in the Bible. And in that, God clearly, not smallly or abstractly, clearly describes what is good music. He also describes what is bad music. He describes what's acceptable to the Lord and what is not acceptable to the Lord. But yet people say, I could do whatever I want and God will be pleased because it makes me feel good. God didn't say the requirement of music to make you feel good. It was to be pleasing to him. You understand, God is very clear. And here, and this is not the only place where God says, your music makes me sick. Notice the word he uses with it, the noise of the song. You know, this isn't the only time that God puts noise with music in a bad way. Remember when Joshua and Moses were up on the Mount of God and they were receiving the instructions for the tabernacle and they came down with the two tablets And as they were walking down the mountain before they even saw what was going on, Joshua said, I hear the noise of war. And God says, that's not the, or Moses said, that's not the noise of war. That's the songs of them singing. And it made God sick. And of course, Moses came down off the mountain and you remember he took those Uh, tablets and he threw them down and destroyed the calf and grounded up the calf and and the whole thing was horrible especially since it was only 40 days since they heard from God not to make a golden calf 40 days they violated almost all the ten commandments in that one service worshiping those calves and the music was an important part of that false worship Again, we're going to go through a whole series on music and what the Bible says about music. But do you understand, the very first choir master of heaven was Satan. Do you know that Satan was made a musical instrument? If you read the description in the book of Ezekiel, he is a musical instrument. Satan knows music. And because he was the choir master of all of heaven, do you know what he knows what music is pleasing to God? Absolutely. Does he also know what makes God sick? You bet he does. Now, again, we're going to go to a whole lecture, but I'm logicking you right now. What do you think displeases God more? An ACDC song about highway to hell that we know is heathens and doesn't have any association, or a song that's supposedly made in worship to God that is not the way that God ordered it? Which one's more disturbing to God? Not the ACDC song. The one that is done in worship of God, but is not acceptable to him. And don't you think that Satan knows how 
to get people to worship God, quote unquote, in a way that God makes them sick? The answer is yes. And the Bible backs that up. Uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. We want to see what the Bible has to say. But that's exactly what happened here. They have their, excuse the term, Christian music. And God says, it makes me sick. I hate it. It disgusts me. I want to spew it out. And they are worshiping God the way that they feel like God should worship. By the way, it's not just music. There are things that people do in Jesus' name all the time. In fact, today they have Christian pornography. We're doing Christian pornography, but we're doing it in Jesus' name, so God has to accept it. Will God accept it? Absolutely not. We know that there are some churches today that have beer and Bible programs. It's a place where single people can meet other single people in a bar-like environment where they have the Bible. Is that pleasing to the Lord? Absolutely not. You understand? They have drive-through churches today. Where you could go through a drive-through instead of getting out of your car. Now this is pre-COVID. You could go through your drive-through, uh, stay in your car, and listen. <coughs> have some Christianette listen to a little sermonette by a preacherette smoking a cigarette. Give them a little five-minute message. They drove through, hear a five-minute devotional, drive off and said, we had church today. Is that acceptable unto the Lord? Now, again, we're getting enough discernment. You guys have been around enough. But you know, there's so many things done in the name of worship and God. And the people legitimately think that God should accept it. And it doesn't. God says, I will not accept it. You understand this is a serious thing. Because everything should come out of our worship of God. By the way, let's define terms really quick and then I'll finish it up. You guys have been patient. What is worship? Worship comes from an old English word of worth-ship. And the idea of true worship, in just a nutshell, is that we are telling God how much we value, how much he is worth to us, what he means to us. That is what worship is. God, you are great. God, you are wonderful. You understand, that's the basics of worship. And there are a lot of things that are done to make us happy, to make us feel good, that doesn't affect God whatsoever. Does that make sense? This is something that is very serious. And for here, God says, I'm wiping out the northern kingdom of Israel because it just makes me sick. I can't do it anymore. I'm tired of your false religion. I'm tired of you mixing things from other gods and trying to attribute it to me and whatever else. Don't even get me started. If you ever really want to hear me get started, listen to a message I've got somewhere about Nimrod, the father of Christmas. That title alone should make you interested and see what God has to say about certain things. That's neither here nor there. There's a lot of things, but God is coming up. You know the worship of Moloch? Here it's talking about you have born the tabernacle of Moloch. The worship of Moloch involved sacrificing children to a false god. Do you think that's acceptable to God in any stretch of the imagination? Absolutely not. And yet people got to the place where they weren't just worshiping Moloch. They sometimes tried to transfer it and say, I'm worshiping God by killing this child. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You say, well, this hasn't been bad. <laughs> haven't been good news. This hasn't been a very encouraging message. Well, let's end with the desire of the Lord. We started with the day of the Lord. Then we saw the disgust of the Lord. Let's go to the desire of the Lord. What is it that God wants? Is he that bad of a taskmaster that we can't please him? The answer is we can be pleasing to him. Notice with me in verse number 14. We see the desire of the Lord. Seek good. Well, that's a good start. That word seek means to chase after. All right? For those of you who have been married, maybe you once had a boyfriend, a girlfriend, you remember those days where there was the pursuit? He chased after you. He called you, wrote you letters, Brought you flowers. He even took a shower and got cleaned up every now and again. There was a pursuit. He was trying to make an impression on you. He put forth the effort. God says seek good. It has that same thing. 
Chase after it. Don't just say, I hope good falls on me. Chase after it. Go after it. Find those things that are good and go after it. That seeking good is not a passive. It just happened to fall in my lap. It's going after it. But notice this. Seek good and not evil. Meaning don't seek evil. Meaning if you see evil over there, don't go walking past it. Stay away from it. Go to the other side. You know how many times we get in trouble just because we were the wrong place? Yeah. And half the time we knew we were there, the wrong place in the first place? Don't go there. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. Seek good and don't seek evil. That ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. God says, <laughs> I'm trying to make it simple. Try to do the things that are right. And don't do the things that are right. Now, the Bible gives us what's right, what's not right, how to get it right, and how to keep it right. God gives us these things. We don't have to guess. God clearly spells it out. Notice verse 15 as it goes on. Hate the evil and love the good. And establish judgment in the gate. That it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Now remember, he's speaking to the northern kingdom. They're known as the tribe of Ephraim from time to time. That's one of the tribes of Joseph. It's another name of speaking to this northern kingdom. He's saying, you know what? In the context, he says, just seek after me. Find what's pleasing to me and do those things and we're good. Return unto me. Just chase after me. What is the best good after all? God. It's the never-ending pursuit of Jesus Christ. May I put it in a different way? Most of us are not battling between the good and the bad. For example, most of us are not planning to go to an adult entertainment joint afterwards. All right, That's not the plan. However, the problem we have is between the good and and the best. That's where our battle is. The best is the never-ending pursuit of Jesus Christ. Chasing after him. Finding him. Going after him. We are often distracted by other good things. Not bad things. Not evil things. We have good things that distract us. We need to set aside the good things and chase after the best things, which is the never-ending pursuit of Jesus Christ. As he said earlier in chapter 5, Seek me. For thus saith the Lord God of the house of Israel, Seek me and you shall live. Verse number 6, Seek the Lord and ye shall live. Verse number 8, Seek him. That's as simple as God says. I want to make things easy on you. I'm not giving you a l- rules of list and re- regulations. I'm not giving you this religion. Follow after Christ. Follow after God. And if you're trying to be pleasing to him, you automatically do those things that are good. That makes it easy. Just find out what's pleasing to God and do that. Amen. Simple. And God says, you do that, you live. Why did Israel get in problem? Because they were not worshiping God. They were not seeking after God. But they were still expecting God to bless them. And their efforts. Even though it wasn't what God wanted. He's trying to make it simple. Now as I mentioned before. The people did not respond well to this message. And they threatened to kill him. Because they didn't like the message. Why? What's so wrong with the message? Because often worship, music, these things are often personal. And because they're personal, our feelings are involved. And because you did something I don't like, I don't like you. Don't we do that? We do. Our emotions get involved. You told me I can't do this anymore. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because he had a mad emotional response. God told him no. God should do what I want anyways. And so he couldn't take it out on God. So he took it out on his brother. Right? Because God said no. But God I did my best. You should do it anyways. No that's not acceptable to me. Fine. And because he got mad. Got bitter. He killed his brother. These people here were told, don't do that. It's not acceptable to God. God should like it anyways. I don't care what you say. 
And so they attempted to get mad at the preacher because he delivered God's message and it was personal to him. Again, this is why we have such a lashback when we talk about music, worship, all this other stuff, because people's person, uh, feelings get involved. And because it's personable, our emotion response. What we should simply do is seek after God. What does God desire? What does God want? What is pleasing to him? And let's do that. Let's make it simple. Let's just follow after God. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.